So good afternoon and uh, welcome everybody. Um, just a reminder or housekeeping just to uh, keep your camera mute and uh, also your microphone during the, the session just to avoid uh, sort of back, background disturbances and uh, hopefully maintain the, the connection uh, through the session. Um, I'm delighted that you've been able to join us and I'm delighted to be introducing Olga Barrera who is a colleague of mine at Oxford Brookes uh, University at present. Um, Olga has been at Oxford Brookes for nearly four years now having spent 10 years working at the University of Oxford on a, a, a range of uh, research projects and there's such a wealth there that I think uh, we could probably use the session uh, today just to go through through that. Um, but uh, she's been a, a senior research associate and uh, postdoc research assistant uh, to name just a few of her, her roles. Uh, she recently spent uh, just over a year um, at the University of Luxembourg as a, a Marie Curie fellow um, and uh, at, at present she's she's working uh, at the Nuffield Dep Department of Orthopaedics, Rheumatology and Muscular Skeletal uh, Sciences uh, as a part of a, a research project at the University of Oxford. Uh, Olga studied uh, for a master's degree at the University of Palermo uh, before moving on to complete her uh, PhD at the University Mediterraneo of Reggio Calabria, if I pronounce that correctly, it'd be a miracle. Uh, but but uh, yeah, I'm delighted that Olga's here to talk about uh, her research on the biomechanics of, meni of knee menisci. Uh, and so at that point, I shall hand over to Olga. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dan, for first of all inviting me to give a talk at IMEKI. I'm very, very, very happy to be here today. Unfortunately, this COVID time here is my screen, but hopefully one day we'll um, we'll meet in um, and do a talk in person. Um, and also thank you for your very nice introduction. So yes, today I like to uh, talk about uh, what I've been doing uh, with biomechanics of soft tissues with the focus on the knee, on the knee, especially in the menisci, which is a, quite an important issue inside the knee. But I just wanted to start giving the, the audience is quite broad and the um, looking at the IME key and the wonderful thing they do. I was like, uh, I wanted to take a few minutes just to to see, to introduce how I see biomechanics um, and, uh, you know, general uh, concept before starting digging in. So uh, I see biomechanics as being a branch of biophysics and it's a, a wonderful way uh, to have the interdisciplinary um, kind of view because it, it, it's, a, it, it's a, a field where you can bridge uh, medicine with uh, mathematics, biology, uh, engineering, and nowadays diet, data science, given the amount of data that we generate. So in biomechanics, really, we apply method used in mechanics and mechanical engineering in, in general, but with the focus of studying the structure, the function and the motion of biological system down to from the cell level to the organism to the or tissues and then uh, organs so it's really a, a field that attracted my attention since uh, um, i started looking in, into this especially i like to see the parallelism between what we learn in mechanics in in mechanical engineering and how we can translate the knowledge to interesting other interesting fields like such as biomechanics 
So here it's um, an example of um, a research I did uh, quite a few years ago, really, on uh, uh, the interaction on dissimilar wells. You say, what, what was the relation between dissimilar wells and tissue? That really, really very different. But actually, if we look at the way we, we solve this problem, which was related to um, subsea uh, uh, kind of connectors. If you see here, there is uh, a, a, an example of uh, two pipes need, needed to be joined. And uh, what happened is that the hydrogen affects the mechanics of the interface between an alloy and a steel. So we started to see uh, OK, looking at the microstructure, looking at fractography and trying to model the effect of hydrogen in the metals, in these dissimilar wells. So what we did and th this kind of problem generates uh, a, a huge. So the, the breaking of those wells generates a huge environmental disaster in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. So then I, I looked back about what I did in order to being able to understand the model, this problem, the effect of hydrogen in the breaking of those dissimilar wells. Well, what we did is doing lots of uh, characterization, um, uh, microscopy work. Uh, then we try to um, see where the fracture would occur, which is in this region where there are lots of particles. Um, very stiff particles. So as we said, OK, then that's the, the region we have to study. And after doing lots of mechanical testing, we find out um, the way we could model this. And actually, we end up with a computational model where we take the microstructure, we um, microstructure the, 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 the body is full of, uh, of hydrogen, then we deform the body and we can predict where the hydrogen will go, which is usually the location where trouble uh, starts uh, happening. So you see, wow, how, how then can we use these kind of methods that uh, we are used to using in mechanical engineering in a field such biomechanics? And uh, I wanted to you know, take some time to do like a, a parallelism to see what are the, challenging, uh, the challenges in biomechanics and what we are used to do very well in uh, normal mechanics. So we do characterization when we want to start, uh, um, you know, studying the behavior of a material, for instance, we did, we do. Uh, so in the case of these dissimilar wells, we have done material testing in hydrogen environment. We can do lots of um, tests. Uh, the materials um, is not difficult to, to get. We have reproducibility of samples. We can observe large number of volume of data, and then we can build these, uh, you know, both phenomenological and physical based material models because we have uh, a, a lot of data to play with. When we, when I started with biomechanics, I started to see all the challenges and difficulty I was going to have. First of all, tissues are, as we, as we know, living objects. So as you observe uh, the tissue under a microscope, if you are not very careful, you see a different structure because it changes. So you need to find it's a fine balance between preserving the tissue and observing it, because by preserving it, you could um, kind of change in structure. Then I went to the massive uh, uh, drama of in vivo versus ex vivo uh, testing and material properties. We, which maybe the, you know two hours will not be enough. Maybe two days to discuss. Then uh, I said, okay, let's characterize it. But then all these tissues are heterogeneous, um, porous materials essentially, and they are functionally graded. So their uh, mechanical properties actually and the, the architecture changes inside the tissue itself. So in order to characterize, you have to map all the properties according to the location where you are in the tissue. So that's in increase the number of sub observation that you have to do. Then the other things that each sample, it's not the same, it's, it's different. Um, experimental data, very few. 
plus lack of standards. So if you look in the literature, groups do different things. They test at different conditions and then somehow uh, people uh, get those data and compare and you have a, a, a huge mix uh, uh, a match of results. The other thing is models. You know, the, 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 the material models um, in biomechanics um, suffer of, uh, of being essentially um, very, very the complexity of biology system. They give rise to complicated mechanistics or physical based model when you know you can derive them with a large number of parameters. Now the, the trick is to have um, express those uh, um, those behavior in a few small number of parameters, uh, you know, phenomenological parameters which can be linked to the microstructure. This is very, very difficult to do because also there are not very many data, uh, experimental data that we can have and that we can reproduce. So I started with this big picture and started to say, okay, you know, step by step, maybe we can contribute to detangle some of the uh, of the issues. But the, the, the good thing I saw uh, in terms of, um, you know, for instance, um, when we want to solve a, a multiphysic model that could be fluid in, inside uh, a tissue, a porous tissues, or hydrogen enrichment in steel, is that the, P, the partial differential equation that govern the, um, the, the phenomena are, can be written in a very similar way. Therefore, we can use the similar method and techniques that we are used to use in mechanical engineering. So that, that was good. I said, OK, maybe one thing that can be uh, uh, done nicely. Um, then you say, why biomechanics? Why, why is useful? Well, it, it's that's maybe you know a bit of a futuristic idea, but uh, I see lots of um, of, of of future and uh, uh, potential impact that we can make. Because imagine we can have a patient, then we can uh, have a model of the patient, you know, called digital twin. And then we, we can put basically from the patient, we can build uh, this model. We using the data that we get from the patient, uh, you know, if he's healthy or disease or organ state. We put in what we uh, have done in terms of organs, in terms of you know the biomechanics of the organs, and then we can play with treatments. For instance, once we have a digital twin of the patient, then we say, okay, then we can um, simulate, for instance, treatments and uh, see what you know, evolution of, of, of a disease can be. So we, we can actually personalize medicine in a way with the help of what we know from the biomechanics. So this is like something that, you know, it, it's it's in my mind, may, maybe for the future, maybe when I retire, I don't know, I hope sooner than that. So let's go into what is the key question in biomechanics and how I started looking at the meniscus. So um, essentially when um, uh, I, I, I wanted to study soft tissue, and I think the meniscus was the best things to start with because there are so many things that are known about these tissues. It's an amazing, uh, very little piece of material that uh, uh, supports basically um, uh, our self. It makes our, uh, you know, um, the upper part of the body connected with the lower part of the body. And one of the uh, of the big problem is in and that's real in all tissues is understanding what is the relationship between the internal architecture of the tissue, the mechanical uh, behavior, therefore the function. What is the function of the tissue? So and that can have a, a large number of, of impact in, in different area. But most important, I wanted to point out what are the tools that we need in order to answer to this question. Well, we need advanced imaging, we need experimental testing, we need multiphysic modeling, we need a way to select models and uh, um, quantify uncertainties. I, I will I will show something later um, to see what that you know what what I mean and probably we need you know, for sure we need machine learning uh, as, as well. So if you can see 
I, I can see, uh, and I work with a lot, you know, uh, quite a lot of people in different areas because, of course, you know, you can't be expert in in everything. Um, but it's really a fantastic journey. So, um, you know, in just in in in, in brief. So what we need in order to um, answer, to know what is the function of uh, an organ and related to the architecture is, first of all, being able to observe the architecture. So imaging, experimental and numerical testing, theoretical and modeling work and computational work. So I will go through all of these and see what I've, I've done um, in the case of the meniscus. So the, the, the other big things that uh, we, we need to bear in mind is that uh, when we do biomechanics, we need to learn to live with uncertainties. Uncertainties in the imaging, because you know you will ask yourself, is the resolution accurate enough? Am I seeing artifacts? How can I avoid artifacts or minimize them? Uh, am I, uh, when I prepare a sample, am I changing the uh, internal structure while I, I prepare it? Then, you know, for the experimental testing, another, you know, bubble of, 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 of uncertainties. We have enough data. Are, uh, are they reproduci reproducible? Um, you know, for the modeling work also, it's like, OK, let's see what is the phenomenon that we want to explore. And we use a question and we constantly ask if the question are simple enough or complicated enough to uh, give us some analytic solution that we can work with when we do numerical modeling. And then there is a big word about uh, computational work, so you know, the macro scale such as fine element models and the uncertainties of, for instance, of uh, applying the right boundary condition um, and how those affect the solution. So I hope I will give you an overview about all this. Uh, first of all, maybe I should start by introducing, uh, a, you know, a, in brief, what is the meniscus? So the, the, the meniscus is, you know, a little cushion here that are in that is basically inside the, the knee joint, which is in between the femur and the tibia, the two bones. And uh, uh, we have two menisci. One is the lateral meniscus and one is the medial menisci, uh, men, men, meniscus. And they have a, a slightly different shape, and also they are connected to the bone because you know they 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 are inserted into the bones, and then they they go back being inserted into the bone. So it's quite interesting also how the 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 tissue changes if you go from bones to the body of the tissue, um, and uh, uh, they touch with the cartilage in the in the you know in um. In a healthy knees, you you have in uh, a layer of of cartilage on the bones because if you have bone and bone contact, you feel lots of pain. Regarding the the tissues, is basically seventy percent water, high uh, percentage of porosity, which actually changes throughout the tissues. So. Um, what does it do? What does the meniscus do? Well, for, for instance, it's it's very debated, you know, in the literature there, are, there, there is a debate on what is exactly the function of the meniscus, but one that everyone agrees on, of course, is low transmission between the upper, the upper part and the lower part of our body. But also there is discussion about being a shock absorber, uh, being contributing to the stability of the knee, uh, and you know, uh, provided joint joint protection. What we know from engineering point of view, it's an, a very interesting tissue because of uh, uh, there is a lot that uh, we can explore with the tools that we have. What uh, we need to notice here, and that's kind of important when we talk about knee and menisci and cartilage, is looking at contact pressure. As engineer, that's something that we can contribute to. Because as you see, the, the, the contact pressure in the cartilage, uh, the, the, the profile changed dramatically if the menisci are in and if they are not in. So it's essential to, um, to have this, uh, uh, this piece of tissues, the, the meniscus, in order to essentially protect the uh, cartilage. So why are we looking at that? Well, from an engineering point of view, we look at that because if you look at the meniscal replacements that are available, they are not ideal to the point that uh, uh, the National uh, Health Service in many uh, countries in Europe 
don't do them. They, 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 they don't uh, fit them in impatient. So if you are young and uh, um, you know you break your meniscus or you tear it or you know you do something really bad, then uh, uh, you know that <laughs> there is not very much. If they have to remove it, uh, there is not very much you can do. And we know that ten years after um, a meniscal uh, meniscectomy, so when they remove the meniscus because it's too broken, you have osteoarthritis. So and then you have to wait until I don't know you are 65, 70 to have a knee replacement. So it's an important problem we want to tackle. OK, so what we do in terms of uh, um, tackling the um, these research question on the meniscus, what we do in terms of uh, in observing internal architecture, measuring mechanical properties, building patient specific model, and uh, uh, see what is the behavior of the meniscus when we apply loading condition that mimic the everyday life activities such walking, running, jumping, etc. So I start with imaging, um, and that's quite quite nice because we can now walk inside the meniscal structure. So we found out that the meniscus actually is a uh, is a highly porous cushion made of essentially channels of, uh, of collagen. In these channels, there is fluid um, that goes in. And what happens is that when you do physical activities, we imagine this meniscus being essentially really like a sponge, a cushion full of these, uh, of these channels where the fluid uh, move in as you walk or run or you know, do any physical activities. So um, if we look at uh, different technique of imaging, such as multiphoto microscopy and uh, uh, micro CT scanning, we see uh, basically the same structure. So porous structure with these uh, meniscal channels. And what we discover is that it's a higher hierarchical architecture. So we see this similar, uh, similar um, kind of architecture going from the micro scale, from the macro scale to the micro scale, going down to the nano scale. So this is, for instance, an FM uh, images, and you could see those channels here, even in, in the shape of waves. So this is really, really interesting, first of all. So we found out a new architecture that we didn't know exist. Then we said, OK, let's explore even more. And let's see what is, for instance, if I have a meniscus here and I extract a little cylinder that goes through the thickness, what is the internal structure of this? Because we say it grades, but we wanted to quantify some parameters that are important uh, for us engineers. So what we found out is that actually the, um, the architecture changes completely from the external layer to the internal layer. And uh, uh, we have a, a series of channels that are aligned so that the structure is ordered inside in the internal layers and is very disordered in the outside layer. And that reflects also the permeability of the tissue, which is less in the uh, external layer and higher in the internal layers, like that the tissue wants to protect the water that is uh, as in. So that's, I'll show you something else on that uh, as well a little bit later. So that's regarding the structure. Let's see what we have done with experimental testing. I, I have, I had to select what to present because we have done a wide range of experimental testing and there's no time to go through all of them. So first of all, you know, as I said, there is no, uh, when I started, I could not see a standard, for instance, or a protocol to slice these type of tissues. So we developed protocols for slicing heterogeneous soft tissues, then imaging uh, and quantify, for instance, the orientation of the collagen channels before we do the testing. And then we try and we try to and we apply this protocol for every test we do. So at least what we do in our in my group 
it's you know it's reproducible in a in a way from like a protocol point of view so what we found out so as i said we we can slice very well this meniscus so we can extract little sample in the external you know in the superficial layer and the internal layer and then we put in the in the machine in the doing uniaxial tension tax for instance and then we can measure the mechanical properties what we saw is that the behavior, uh, so the, 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 the meniscus, the, the, the material behavior, it's, it's uh, basically stiffer. So if we see the, the stiffness is higher in the superficial layer and it's quite low inside. So there is about an order of magnitude uh, between the um, young modulus in the, in the um, uh, kind of outside layer versus the internal layer. So we can actually relate the uh, how the architecture is with the fact that the mechanical properties, uh, you know, changes and they reflect uh, kind of these uh, um, ar architecture feature. So um, then we went to doing DMA, so dynamic mechanical analysis, because really uh, it, with, with this tool we can um, uh test uh the meniscus under conditions such as for instance uh, re repetitive loading such as you know, slow run or fast run or walking and then with the aim of characterize the time dependent behavior of the of of, of the tissue is it viscoelastic is it poor elastic it's uh, you know there is a there is a lot that we can say about that but what I think is striking and what uh, really catch, uh, caught our attention is that we thought the meniscus would behave such a like uh, more or less like a polymer. But what we found actually is that uh, if we do the frequency sleep, uh, uh, sweep, we saw that the highest the frequency, the more the damping and the elasticity as well. Well, if you look at polymers, um, it's not like that because you have uh, the highest, you, you have a situation where you have high frequency, then uh, uh, you have a, a more elastic behavior, and, and but then you reduce the damping. So um, that was an, an interesting result uh, for us to, to see. The other thing he said, OK, um, does the meniscus have uh, uh, impact absorption capability? Can we say something about this uh, function of being shock absorber? Well, we have done uh, some preliminary testing on uh, uh, you know, high strain rate uh, with the optimism bar, and I'm really amazed that we actually could achieve a dynamic equilibrium. So we can test these meniscus, we can shoot the meniscus and actually see the behavior being very similar to some foams or reinforced foams that uh, are used basically in aerospace engineering, for instance. So that's quite an interesting result. So we are doing more of that. You know, uh, we are planning to do more tests where we test the meniscus at different uh, uh, strain rate and we look at the behavior of it. OK, so uh, just a big picture of uh, some mechanical properties I like highlights. Well, you can uh, I'm not going to read that, but just uh, uh, show, for instance, an image of uh, the, uh, DAC done on uh, by actual testing in order to characterize the anisotropy of the tissue. Of course, the tissue is anisotropic and uh, um, we have collected something like 200 uh, tests that we are still analyzing to see what are the material properties in different directions. Um, and, uh, you know, doing DAC in these uh, um, soft tissues that are immersed in water is not something straightforward. I, I learned at my expenses, but um, somehow we, we, we managed. And uh, the other things that uh, I think is nice to see is uh, um, that in order to study the permeability of the tissues in different regions of the meniscus, we have been running some uh, confined compression tests uh, in the lab, but also we do that numerically. And I will show you why in, in a second. So what we done experimentally show us that, for instance, the permeability is high in the body region, which is the central body of, of the meniscus, and is lower in the anterior and, and posterior horn. We also had, uh, um, you know, we, we have uh, parameters that we have extracted from experimental data, with, 
which uh, I will I will show in a minute. So then uh, the nice things about this, I think, is that with this uh, uh, technique and methodology and protocol that we have, we are able to map the meniscal uh, properties in different region, you know, from the red, which is the vascularized uh, part of the meniscus to the white, which is the avascular part and in, in the in the different region and through the thickness. So that's something I, I, I haven't seen um, study uh, that have been done like that. Um, and I'm also happy that we can before doing the testing, uh, we we can compute, we can analyze and, and quantify the orientation of the collagen fibers. So then uh, we can construct this fabric tensor of the meniscal tissues. And also what we are doing, and I think this is really interesting, is building meniscus properties map. So in order to understand what is the relationship between architectural feature and mechanical properties, we need to go back to, I don't know if you are probably familiar with the uh, Ashby maps, but it's something that I like very much because it's a visualized um, approach where you can have, for instance, mechanical parameters such as the elastic modulus in one axis and uh, something related to uh, um, the architecture, for instance, the orientation of the of the fiber in, in, in the X axis. And then we can map and we can see the different region of the meniscus where 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 they sit um, and that that can be done also with um, you know other type of experiments such as uh, um, you know confined compression tests where you have per permeability in one axis and maybe pore index in the other axis or the dimension of the channels in the other axis so we can start uh, building those maps and also in order to address the paucity of uh, of of, uh, of experimental tests done, um, what what we want to do is actually build a, a database where people can contribute to people that do tests on the meniscus could actually uh, put those data in this database, and then we can map those in a reference meniscus. So this is, you know, a way that we can overcome this scarcity of, uh, of, of data that we have. So this is part of a, a bigger project and I, I hope um, it will continue to go ahead. Now, I, I did mention machine learning. I don't want to be, uh, you know, saying I know about it because I, I have never really uh, dealt with machine learning so far. I am learn, I am studying actually uh, quite quite a lot, but so far what I see machine learning be useful here to me is, uh, um, is in order to um, relate what are the influence of the architectural feature in, for instance, the permeability. So what I see being useful is, is that I have an image. I, I know what is the channel, the collagen channel connectivity, tortuosity, dimension, and uh, uh, other stuff. Then I have this uh, black box called the uh, um, machine learning function. And then my output is the permeability. So if we kind of do the, 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 this process, probably we can also analyze what is of the architectural feature that is more in, most important for the permeability. Is it the connectivity of those channels or is, for instance, the dimension? What is that um, make, what is that define the, that permeability value? Um, so I think that's something that um, we, we are probably will uh, start doing in the, in the, in the near future. Going to uh, numerical testing, so um, you know you, you probably you, you got already that uh, I think that permeability is one of the key parameters for um, at least the meniscus, but I guess other soft tissues, and uh, um, and the relationship between the architectural parameters and and those value of uh, permeability. So we have done experimental testing, but the experimental testing are limited to basically the number of, uh, of sample you can get uh, from, you know, cadavers or from uh, people that uh, do um, uh, a, a, knee, a knee replacement operation and we can retrieve 
one semi-intact uh, meniscus. Um, and also the way we do the test in the lab is not always precise because you can't really cut the sample of the same, um, you know, very precise shape to go in the confined compression um, uh, camera that we have. So there are complications and the data are not very many. So we thought, OK, we need computational tools. We need to do this confined compression test in a computer and have lots of data that we can analyze. And the other thing is, why do we need that? Because we need to understand what are the laws that relate, for instance, the pressure gradient and the fluid flux inside those channels. So it's usually modeled with a law called Darcy's law. I don't know if you are all familiar with that, but I, I will introduce uh, uh, gently in the next slide. And uh, those, this Darcy law is very, is very much used for tissues. And actually we ask if this is the right form of law to use. So maybe just taking a step back on what Darcy law is. So the Darcy law uh, uh, relate Q, which is the fluid flux to a gradient of pressure. So he predicted that there is a linear relationship between uh, the flux and the gradient of pressure linked by the permeability. And also there is no time dependence in that. What we see that is in reality, there is no linearity in this graph here at all. And this is really due to the complex architecture that we have inside the tissues. And also we have time dependency in that. Uh, given by the fact that as you compress, for instance, the tissue, some of the of the of the channels get you know uh, compressed, some of them um, are blocked, so you can't have any fluid out. So there are many many phenomena that can uh, appear. But basically, what we saw is okay. This is not right. The, the normal there's still law. What can we do? And then I started looking at this fractional model. So uh, that's probably look a little bit odd to um, you know some of you, but essentially, uh, is uh, these uh, fractional derivative are the derivative of non-integer order. So you, we are used to have a, a derivative of order one, first derivative of order two, second derivative. But these fractional derivative are you know in between. For instance, this beta can be between zero and one. Uh, and uh, mathematicians have used that uh, since long time. Engineers are, you know, caught up in the last probably ten years. But now we we can use those um, uh, type of uh, mathematical uh, uh, law uh, in order to tackle um, t f f phenomena in nature, such as you know tissues and stuff. So. Let, let's see, then, then we said, okay, what is a, a way to do numerical testing so that we can see if this form of fractional Darcy law can be used? So what we do, we go from a, a scan of the tissues and we have a different range of resolution done. Then we want to, we transform them in a, a computational free dynamic mesh and solid mesh so that we can put, for instance, you know, the CFD mesh. The, um, uh, so we, we, we can do a computation free dynamic uh, simulation. So we can have the meniscus, uh, for instance, in, inside a tube. We apply a gradient of pressure and we see what is the velocity inside those channels. And that's kind of uh, uh, super interesting because this way we can have some information about the permeability. Now, the problem with those simulations is that, of course, uh, they are time consuming. The architecture is functionally graded, so we need a lot of this simulation to be done in order to have a quite a conclusive argument. But uh, we are uh, training some engineering, uh, some engineers to do that, so we hope to have a lot of data quite soon. One thing that, stro that uh, struck my attention is that actually it's very difficult at, at, at the first sight to understand what is the permeability because you can apply, um, uh, you know, either have a, as an input a, a, a velocity of fluids and measure the gradient of pressure, but depending on where you are in the tissue in this architecture here, you have different curves. So in the, this way, it was difficult to find a characteristic characteristic length 
where we can say, okay, this is one value of permeability. Actually, there is a range of, of, uh, of values of, uh, per, of, of uh, permeability, and that's really uh, related to how the architecture is inside even only three millimeters of length of that tissue. So it's something really, really super in interesting. Uh, and then there is a lot of work being done on, on that uh, as, as, as well. So then uh, we saw, okay, we can do CFD, but what about the real problem when you do um, a confined compression test in the lab? Essentially, you are doing a consolidation test. So we are taking a piece of, uh, of, of meniscus, we are applying a compressive stress, and we want to measure how, what is the velocity of the fluid at the bottom of the sample in order to then use um, kind of models such as the poroelastic model uh, to uh, essentially fit experimental, you know, numerical curve in this case and get the permeability out. So that's something that is super difficult to do. There are many, many, many computational problems which we are tackling one by one, but I think doing numerical uh, consolidation tests is the way forward to understand how these highly porous tissues work and really in, in their real architecture. So then uh, we thought, okay, wh why all this, uh, um, all this stuff about Darcy law? Why is it important to modeling tissue? Well, because Darcy law is, a, is, a is one of the main ingredients when we look at the poroelastic material model, which is one of the models that is most used in, uh, you know, soft solids, uh, you know, soft porous solids and tissues. So really, if we look at the governing equation, we have here, uh, you know, a stress tensor equation where, where with a term here that is related to the, where P is the pore pressure. So then we couple this, uh, uh, th this equation here with another equation, which is the pore pressure diffusion equation, which basically gives the link between the pressure in the pore and the variation of fluid content. So if we look how this pore pressure diffusion is derived, the Darcy law is one of the three ingredients. We have conservation of mass, we have Darcy law, and we have variation of fluid content. All these three equations give us a differential equation, which is in this case is a fractional because I put in the fraction of Darcy law, that essentially uh, has to be coupled with the stress, uh, you know, tensor. Now we can implement that in commercial software such uh, uh, Abacus, and you know we have done that so that we can actually model the consolidation test also for, with uh, with the FE simulations. So that's you know all nice, and uh, um, with this model we can actually uh, fit our experimental curves very well, and we can have a value of the fractional derivative, so the order of derivative, and the permeability, which is a little bit anomalous because if you look at the units, is not like the the normal uh, units, but there is a dependence on on time with a uh, with power here. But uh, that's you know probably another talk. <laughs> so that's all good. At least we now have a model, and we can actually do that. You know, put this uh, um, uh, cylinder inside Abacus, for instance, and do consolidation tests, and we can measure. Uh, the pore pressure, for instance, here, and 11 is the degree of freedom pore pressure. Um, and then if you see what I did with uh, uh, when I model the behavior of the hydrogen, um, you know, the coupled behavior of uh, hydrogen diffusion and the formation is essentially the same code. It's just the diffusion equation is different and the coupling between mechanics and diffusion is different. But if you see the code, and the elements I use are exactly the same. So I was like, wow, this is, uh, um, you know, something powerful, something that we can use to, you know, um, transfer knowledge in other field. So, um, so that that's all good. That's at, at, the, at, the, at the material level, but then let's see what we can do from, you know, a bit more macroscopic scale. 
So um, our computational work is, is being uh, uh, done with a, a patient specific model. This is a, this is a final element um, model of, 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 of a knee and that's taken from an MRI and lots of work have been, have been done in order to build this model. But anyway, uh, I just wanted to point out to what are the important um, things that we want to measure with a patient specific model. So first of all, contact mechanics, uh, of course, you know, that's quite kind of, you know, main main things to look at both, you know, so contact pressure and contact area in cartilage and menisci during physical activities. There is a, a lot at the moment going on regarding uh, some knees that load more the menisci and some knee that actually load more the cartilage it's still not known what are the parameters that influence the contact mechanics in the knee. So we wanted to make our contribution to that. And we want to identify factors that can be geometrical, um, material uh, parameters, boundary condition that influence the contact mechanics. And, and, and also we want to explore and quantify the change in contact mechanics when some soft tissues in the knee are damaged, such as ligaments, uh, can be the menisci, can be the cartilage. So um, our modeling strategy has been uh, done this way. You know, depending on what we want to explore, we can simplify the model uh, in order to to answer one research question at a time because it's it, it's quite a lot to tackle. So first of all, with the patient specific model, we wanted to see what is the effect of the choice of the material model that we have for the meniscus in the solution. Then we want to explore the boundary conditions. So for instance, how the solution changes, we change the constraint of the menisci. And also we want to explore what are the features that affect the uh, contact behavior. So let's start with the effect of the choice of the material model. So if you see this, this model is quite detailed because we model the bone, the cartilage, the menisci. We also have uh, uh, ligaments that you know are, are activated or not, de depending on the on the load that we applied. For instance, those are just simple simulation on the static the static compression. And we say, okay, let's have a look at the model in the literature and the the um, what people use in uh, FE in order to model the meniscus. And there is a variety of model that are used actually. And choosing one of the other can change quite a lot the way that the meniscus deform. So for instance, I put, I put here an example of uh, uh, fitting that we did with uh, some experimental testing. You know, we can fit uh, Ogden models, for instance, or hyperelastic model and uh, uh, other type of, uh, of, mo of models such as the Holtzfeld-Gasser-Ogden model, uh, which is a physical bay model. So we have fittings and then we put this number in the um, in, in abacus and we see what is the difference. And we do that also for rate dependence, so for viscoelastic model as well. So depending on, uh, and so we have all these nice fitting with the parameters, then we run the simulation, same simulation with different uh, uh, material models for the menisci, and we see a huge difference. So if you see here, we take, so this is the meniscus, we take one path, which is called, for instance, here CM. So those path is path where uh, we see um, um, meniscal tears happening. And what we measure is the radial uh, strain in this path. So we take one path and we look at how the, the radial strain varies along the path with different material models. You could see that there is a uh, you know, huge difference. And it's something that people that do um, maybe a fun element model of knee, if they have the meniscus in, which is not very common to do, but then we really need to be careful about uh, what is the material model we choose uh, and, and, and why we choose that, because uh, it, it can make a huge difference in the solution. So then, uh, so that was our uh, patient specific model, but then uh, we, we started to say, okay, now we have this view that actually the meniscus is not one lump of material. We have different properties if, is, uh, you know, if we go through the thickness. 
So we built, we built simplest um, knee model, which are not patient specific, but be, because we want to explore different things. For instance, if we then model the meniscus as you know three layers material, where we put in our um, you know for instance elastic modular different you know for for each of these layer, what is the different in the solution? That's something that. Um, I, I, I haven't seen because those are our own our own data that we put in. And actually, you know, this very simple model tell us that um, there is a huge difference if you have um, a, a meniscus model as a lump of material isotropic, if there is, if you put anisotropy in, and if you do the uh, three layers model. So if you see here, we have higher uh, contact pressure, so the meniscus is loaded more. Remember that the internal layer is very soft. So um, with that, we we expect the um, meniscus being more loaded, essentially, so increase of uh, contact pressure. So that's something uh, uh, really nice because uh, and we are doing e e even more because then the idea is to put all these into a patient specific model. Uh, but first of all, we had to start with the, you know, going simple and doing one thing at a time in order to have all the ingredients for the big model. But then we asked, you know, when we ran this simulation, we thought that the meniscus was, the contact uh, pressure were always very, very localized. And we thought, why the meniscus doesn't get, uh, even on the patient-specific model, the meniscus was was not really loaded. We didn't see a lot of contact pressure. So we started to look at what are the, the what is the reason for that. So one reason is the menisci are mobile, as we know, especially the lateral one being more mobile than the medial. And in the previous model, and what is usually in the in the in the literature menisci are fixed. For instance, the the posterior anterior horn are fixed to the bone. Well, in reality, is not like that, because what 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 uh, we see is that the meniscus is attached to the bone through some ligamentous type of tissues, which recently uh, apparently it uh, it was discovered that is uh, might behave as a muscle as well. So if you model the meniscus being restrained to the bone, for instance, here to the tibial plateau, or being free to actually uh, move by being linked by uh, these ligaments here, which can be modeled as connectors, then we see a big difference because what we can do is that we can actually constrain the meniscus to the bone as they are in reality through these ligamentous type of tissues. And we have a way doing these uh, modeling as connectors to change the stiffness of these ligaments. So we can model a situation where, sorry, where the ligaments are, um, you know, very stiff, so the meniscus can move very much, or they are, you know, very soft, so the meniscus can actually have the space to, to move around. And what we see, is that so we apply a vertical uh, displacement and we, we move this uh, spherical element which model the femoral, uh, femoral condyle and uh, uh, what we see is that basically the uh, the meniscus change its shape in order to increase the contact area with the you know layer of cartilage and minimize the contact pressure so this is something that uh, we, we can see by having this model of a, a, a mobile meniscus, which uh, I haven't, you know, maybe I'm not, uh, but what I've seen in the, in the literature and what I've done before is constrain these meniscus in, on the bone, so even through the kind of the end of, of the meniscus here, or some models, the meniscus is, is tied to the tibial plateau. You see here, the difference in, 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 in contact pressure, they are very localized to one end of, of, of the meniscus, very different from what we think happen in, in reality, that basically that the meniscus uh, is mobile and it just adapt uh, the shape according to the loading condition. So I think that's something that we need to, 
take into account when we do our patient specific model and we refine the boundary condition. So boundary condition have a huge effect on the contact mechanics of, of, of the knee and need to be taken into account. So as a, as a final slide, in order to try and of, uh, tie up what, um, what we have done and where we want to go. So the ultimate aim of, uh, of, of, of this work is that we could contribute to meniscal replacement um, through you know, a deep study of the tissue itself. So what, what what we are you know planning to do, and uh, you know the strategy can be applied to other tissues as well, is that we start from physical observation of the of the structure. We have all the elements to do that. We have a huge variety of imaging technique that can be used. We do um, statistical analysis of the properties. We build simplified microstructure. In, uh, so we simplified essentially the, the microstructure that we see. We put in a computer, we simulate, for instance, the, 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 the effect of uh, you know, the physical response of the tissues when you apply loading and fluid flow inside the structure. Then we need to have a you know a way like training neural network to have homogenized parameters because you know as I said. Every time you you move uh, um, in the tissues, you have a slightly different response. So we need to have a way to homogenize the behavior and build our you know fun element more, run our fun element model with homogenized material properties. Then we can play with okay, we improve the microstructure and then we change it until we see the behavior being similar to a native tissue. So once we are happy with that, then we can kind of manufacture and test uh, artificial meniscus pump tool. So that's kind of uh, uh, the direction that we are going to. It'll probably take another five, ten years be before that's you know has a, a, a full picture. But just I like to have a, a goal and just work towards that. Um, I don't know, I think I probably talked too much. I just wrote some uh, points to wrap up. I'm not going to, to read it. I don't, don't want to bother you, but uh, uh, I hope um, I get a, an overview of what I do and what can be done uh, for other tissues in order to understand the structure function relationship. And uh, <clears throat> this is a list of recent publication that, uh, that we have on this um, if you are interested I can I can share that with you and huge thank you to uh, everyone that has uh, you know contributed so far to this journey and I hope uh, many of you want to get in touch there is plenty of things to do um, so yeah I hope to uh, hope you enjoyed the talk and I haven't bored you too much thank you thank you very much Olga very, very interesting and uh, informative there. Um, yeah, really good. Uh, there's a few questions that have come up and yeah. uh, one one is uh, related to how how meniscus properties vary with age. Maybe maybe that's not not known, but yeah, that's uh, yeah. Um problematic to to know in a way because um, well when I started I tested cadaveric knees and they were all very very old patient you know they, they came from a tissue bank and the um, people were like 92 95 so they were all damaged and what you see when you open you do many shectomies in those knees that which are very very expensive by the way to buy is that some of the knees don't have menisca at all or they have a, a, a very thin layer all like damaged so it would be a nice study to do but you need a lot of so you you need essentially materials you need menisca of people at different age and that's very difficult to obtain unless as we are doing we are starting a pilot study of um, trying to do in vivo in vivo um, to try to, to understand what are the um, kind of the uh, the mechanical properties of tissues from images from for instance MRI uh, under uh, weight bearing MRI 
and then look at different age patients because that's not invasive an MRI and you can see a different uh, you know, uh, various age patient, but it's not an easy thing to do. And it can, I think that can be only done in vivo uh, through imaging, not through experimental uh, testing, because you need to have so many data. Um, probably if you get all the work contributing to my database, that can be done. But uh, <laughs> yes, they change, how they change, who knows? We, we know that, um, the stiffness changes, uh, change, probably the internal layer gets stiffer and it, it, you lose that softening that, that basically give you the impact absorption, but that's one of my uh, theories. Uh, I have to verify it. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah, it does sound uh, challenging to identify. Um, as a, another one is, uh, yeah, de detailing how you distinguish viscoelasticity and poroelasticity this might be a rabbit hole for for this session so uh, yeah it, it, there's a brief briefish answer is that there is uh, there is a lot that actually we, we are doing because essentially you can model the behavior of the meniscus with both so both poroelastic models and viscoelastic model are time dependent models but the, the beauty of poroelasticity, and I think why is good for, for, for tissue to stick with that, is because you actually uh, model the effect of fluids inside the porous structure. So the time-dependent behavior comes from fluid through going in through the pores, in through the channels, rather than from the solid being viscoelastic. It's not a lump of um, solid material, which is viscoelastic, what I see it is having a, a, a skeleton, a solid structure, we can actually be very much elastic, but then having the fluid in, which gives you this time dependent behavior. And I think this is the simplest way and the most effective way to model those materials. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, one here, do, do you envisage being able to produce an artificial meniscus one day? If so, how far are we from that? So I, I very much hope so, uh, not clearly on my own, but um, I see a, a very good um, step forward to, um, to do that with people doing uh, uh, printing of tissues. So there's bio ink that used to uh, make artificial organs. And I think uh, linking with these groups and uh, um, kind of putting together the knowledge that we have built, uh, I think we, we are in good position probably five to ten years, maybe two years sees. <laughs> that, that, that would be a good, a good guess. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I, I think for it for sure in another five years to uh, to get there. Yeah, fair enough. On its way though, on its way. Well, yeah. <laughs> in Hopefully. progress. Yes, in progress. Um, we've got a well question with two parts. Uh, d d d might 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 be again. Uh, another talk in, in a sense, but uh, how did you define the contact mechanics between the menisci and articular cartilage? Well, there, there is, uh, yeah, as you, as you said, probably um, another talk on that because uh, uh, we have different way we can uh, um, doing like a, a, a classical uh, penalty function. Uh, we can play with the ties. We, the, 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 there is a lot. Maybe maybe that can be dealt uh, on an email stuff because it's really um, a, a big a big uh, a, a big uh, field to go into. But uh, essentially, uh, so there are two soft things coming together, and uh, we need to be sure that then, you know, of course, they don't penetrate. Uh, so the elements, uh, um, you know, don't overlap to each other, and um, we we use for that standard abacus. So so we basically we have been using the uh, contact 
properties they are in there. So there is nothing advanced on the contact mechanics type of things, no more than what Abaku says, for instance. Um, but I can, I can uh, maybe you can give me the email. I can do more, more, more information. Can give more information on okay. that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and that Dan, can I just interrupt? If if yeah. people have questions they'd like to follow up, if they email them to me, I will I will uh, send them on to uh, Olga, and and everyone should have my email from the notices that went out for the event. Thank, thanks, Brian. Yeah, that that's perfect. So, okay. um, Brian Walker uh, will pass pass any questions on, and uh, that was in your email. Um, I think I think the second part of that question is probably one uh, about uh, boundary conditions coming from the menis menisco tibial ligaments, and perhaps that's one to follow up on. Uh, yes. Is it? Yeah. Yes, um, that, that, that's quite in interesting because that's a new uh, a new a new things that uh, we, we we have done only recently, and that's um, really as, as I said coming from what we saw being the contact pressure when when we had this model where the menisci were constrained like fixed to the bones um, at, at least for instance the lateral meniscus being fixed to to the bones and then be freeing, uh, not having any other constraint on, on the side, but changing that. So th when we did that, we had a very localized contact pressure. Then when we see what in reality happened, that is actually mobile. And uh, so we start to think, OK, then if we actually model these ligamentous tissues with these connectors, things change dramatically. We see actually the meniscus being, you know, quite started moving in order to increase the contact area with the cartilage and uh, uh, decrease the contact pressure essentially. So in order to kind of preserve itself. And that's something that uh, we, we didn't know before unless, you know, because we didn't model the constraint like that. And the nice thing is with these connectors that you can play with the stiffness of them. So you can have a situation where, for instance, you want to model uh, a connectors like a ligaments with the grading uh, stiffness, for instance, just to say, OK, if the root, the meniscal root is damaged, how does the meniscus move under loading? That's something that we, with this type of, uh, of constraint, we can explore with the model. I don't know if um, that has answered the question, but um, as I said, uh, e email and then I will give loads more information. Yeah, I think think that'd be uh, probably best to uh, for for that ever expanding uh, topic. I think that would be be the case. Um, no, I think the the last question there then I think is how do you intend on building the map of the meniscal property? Uh, for the reference meniscus in terms of normalizing data? Well, that's kind of um, uh, so something that needs to be thought through uh, a, a little bit more because at, at the moment we are at the stage of collecting data. Um, and then uh, uh, what we could do is something that we do actually in, in, in final element when we want to map uh, you know the kind of the, the the element to the parent element. I don't know if what, what is the if you have a computational background, but you could uh, through function just have this uh, um, model of you know properties and then report them to a parent meniscus. But I I can. Um, in a in a way I, sh I should have like a, a whiteboard or something, but. Um, I, I can give more info on that as well because um, that's something that I haven't done yet. So Still watch work, this space. Work in progress then. By the yes, of it. work in progress. First of all, it's collecting all these data, the big problem because um, it's a big effort and uh, we need lots of, uh, well, we have our own data already, which are, uh, the volume of them is, is high, but I like also other people to contribute to see uh, if we can uh, improve the kind of the the number of uh, of, of tests that we can look at. 
yeah. Well, I think we, we have had, well, I'm conscious we're, we're slightly over the, the, the time and there is one more question. So um, I think maybe if, if the, the person uh, typing that would be able to, to um, uh, well, accept a short answer, but then follow it up with an email. There's, there's one is how much do you value the problem of fatigue and fracture of the menisci? And two, are there any living cells helping regulate the turnover of menisci? Well, uh, difficult question. So uh, fatigue and fracture. Um, so the 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 the, the thing I I, I did um, you know probably three years ago um, is doing um, uh, fatigue testing on the the roots meniscal roots. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, the, it can be tackled in, ma in many ways. One is, uh, you know, doing like DMA testing by doing uh, cyclic loading um, on, on this. The tissue doesn't really fracture uh, because there is a self-healing uh, uh, procedure going on. The tissue actually uh, is made to avoid um, if you don't have a, a, a dramatic injury structure if you are young. Uh, and the thing is that the only uh, way I, I could see um, fatigue and fracture is, is on the being really an important thing is on the um, on the meniscal roots, especially because they are when there is a, a, an injury there, the surgeon will repair with uh, some suture. So the properties of the of the of the suture for instance uh, influence the you know the amount of time uh, the amount of cyclic loading that the meniscus can end undergo before breaking again so it's it's a different uh, project itself and someone has actually asked me to just do a project on the meniscal roots because they are so important for for uh, surgeons but you know it's there is so much to do that um, Probably if you have a team of 100 people, you could say you dedicate a team only on that. But uh, it is an interesting um, any, any, a, an interesting topic, actually. Um, also to see at, uh, you know, partial replacement, for instance, if you want to act only on the meniscal roots, then this is the part to look at for uh, fatigue and fracture. OK, OK. Well, I thank you for that. I think now's a good time to maybe uh, uh, draw to a to a close uh, on uh, what has been a, a very interesting uh, topic and we can see the sort of level of interest in the topic by the the questions um, so I think at this point I just thank you Olga for taking the time out to to uh, prepare and deliver this talk and it, it really was uh, an interesting event so thank you to yourself thank you for inviting me pleasure and uh thank you very much for or to all of the uh, the attendees thank you for joining and just a reminder please do email brian with any questions and they will be passed on to olga in uh, in due course